So for this one, we're asked to determine the required diameter to the nearest millimeter for the rods AB and CD, such that their average normal stress does not exceed 180 megapascals. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is determine the force that's in each of these rods. Once we know that, we're going to be able to use our stress equation, which is equal to force divided by area. If we're able to calculate the cross-sectional area, we're then going to be able to calculate the required diameter. So let's start with drawing the free body diagram. So I'm just going to take this body, i.e. like the beam part out. And from there, we should be able to determine the force in each of these rods because they're going to exert forces onto the beam. So each of these is a two force member. Okay, this one as well. So what that's going to mean is the direction of the force is in the direction of the member. And again, I've done a recap video on this topic if you want more clarification around these two force members. So in this case, since these are vertical members, we would expect that the direction of the force that they apply is, is vertical. So I'm going to assume that they're going to go up. Let's call this one FCD, this one FAB. And the reason I'm assuming they're going to go up is because all these others are going down. So they're going to be the ones that, that counteract it. So this one's 4, yep. 10, 3, and 6. All right, so now we need to apply our equilibrium equations in order to determine the unknowns. So just a reminder that we have three equations that we can potentially use. I'll just leave the dimensions in here so we can see them. All right, so if we started with the sum of forces in the x direction, it's probably not going to be very useful to us um, because we actually have no forces in the x direction on this diagram. So if we then started with sum of forces in the y direction, we're going to end up having two unknowns in that equation, so we're not going to be able to solve it directly. Our last option is to do sum of moments, and if we conveniently picked either, I guess, this point here or this point here to sum about, um, we're going to have only one unknown appearing, appearing in the equation, which is good. makes our life a little bit easier. So that's the approach I'm going to use. Um, I might just go with this one here, which is point A. So if we sum our moments about A, they have to be equal to zero. And I'm assuming anti-clockwise is oh, positive, oh, not X. All right, so this one is acting through point A, so it's not going to create a moment, and we can leave it out of the equation. The next one is the 4 kilonewtons. And this one is acting at a distance from A, which we're going to get from this diagram of 2 meters. And it's going to try and rotate this clockwise, so it becomes negative. Next, we have the 10 kilonewtons. This is acting at a distance in here of four meters from point A. Again, it's gonna try and rotate clockwise so it's negative. We've got the three kilonewton force, which is at a total distance of six from point A. Again, it's gonna try and pull it around clockwise so it's negative. We've got a six kilonewton force acting at a distance of 8.5. Again, it's going to be negative because it's going to pull it clockwise. And finally, we have FCD, our unknown. It's going to be acting at the full length of the beam, which is 9.5 meters. And it's going to try and pull us anti-clockwise about point A, so it's going to be positive. So we can solve for the only unknown in that equation, which is FCD. And it comes out to be 12.32. Now, because all of my forces in here are in kilonewtons, this answer is going to come out in kilonewtons as well. All right, so now we just need to determine the other one, which is FAB. Um, I think the easiest way to do this one is probably just to sum in the y direction, because now that we know FCD, let me mark it in, we've only got the one unknown that's going to end up in that equation. So FAB goes up. All these applied forces go down, that's why they're negative. And finally, our force um, that we just solved for is going up, so it's positive. So we can solve for FAB, and it comes to be 10.68 kilonewtons. All right, so now that we know both of these, what we should be able to do is look at the stress. So we can relate stress um, with the force in the area, 
we have our equation of course which is stress is equal to force divided by the original area of your member so we're told that we're looking for a diameter of our member which suggests that we have a circular cross-sectional area so if we have a diameter which I'll call do we can relate them together with the relate it together with the area using this equation so it's pi on 4 d squared so let me substitute this in over here okay and now what we're going to want to do is rearrange for d so i'm going to multiply d squared up to the top line so it's going to become d o squared and at the same time i'm going to divide this down to the bottom line on the other side All right, so to get D on its own, all we need to do is take the square root. Oops, sorry. I can put 4 on the top line, but um, I won't bother. Ah, what am I doing? <laughs> Pi on 4 times sigma. All right, so this is an equation that relates together um, the force applied onto the member, the stress, and also the diameter that we're looking for. So we're going to be able to use this on both of our different members. So let's start with um, AB. Right. So we can apply this equation for the diameter. Now we know that the force in AB we calculated just before, it's 10.68 newtons, sorry, kilonewtons. So 10.68. Now I'm going to convert it into newtons, which means I need to multiply it by a thousand. We then divide by pi on 4 and the stress limit that we're looking for. So if we scroll back up, we were told that the stress is not allowed to exceed 180 megapascals. So coming back down here. All right, so um. Looking at the units, if we wanted to, we could convert this from megapascals into just straight pascals, in which case our answer would come out in meters. The alternative is if we leave this in megapascals, because our force was in newtons, this should come out in millimeters. So either way you want to do it um, is completely fine. Just make sure you watch for the units that you're using. So this comes out to be 8.69 millimeters approximately. So we can do the same thing for BC. Whoops, let's try that again. So the force applied um, for um, BC, we worked out as well. We scroll back up. Sorry, it's not BC. The other one is called CD. This one here. So we worked out it's 12.32. We need to times that by 1,000 to put it into newtons. When we divide by pi on 4, multiplied by our um, stress restriction, again it was 180 megapascals. So this comes out to be 9.33 millimeters. Alright, so the only thing left is if we scroll back up to the top, it wanted us to determine the required diameter to the nearest millimeter. So we need to round our answer. So if we scroll back down, the trick is that we're going to want to round our answer up because this is the absolute minimum that we can do. So if we reduce it and we're in this case to round it down say to 8 millimeters, um, what we'd find is that um, we would exceed our stress limit of 180. So the answer that we need to provide here is going to be the rounded up version which is 9. Same with this one here, if we round this down to 9 millimeters, we're going to end up exceeding the stress limit of 180 megapascals, but if we round it up to 10, we're going to reduce the stress experienced in our wire. So the answer to that one is 10. So that's all there is for this question, and see you in another video.